So, yeah, thanks for the welcome. Um, Philip asked me to cover a few things this afternoon, so I'm going to rattle through quite a lot. Um, some of it will be very familiar, some of it may, may be less familiar. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of background about the crisis we're facing. I think most of you will know more than I do, or as much as I do, on that, so I don't want to go into too many details. And then we're going to think quite a lot about what the Bible says about why we should be good stewards of creation. And then I want to think about how we can engage this relational piece, how we can engage as individuals and as churches and as businesses and everything else uh, with the environmental crisis. But first of all, I just want you to turn to your neighbor, if you've got one, just for one minute, and just think. This is going to work. No? Next. Which bit do I click to go next? <laughs> Sorry. Should I do it? Yeah. yeah. OK. Yeah. OK. Can we get the next one? Yes. So, when was the last time you heard the environment spoken about in church? Not including Harvest Festival. <laughs> if you have Harvest Festival in your church. You've got a few seconds, 30 seconds to just turn to your neighbor. <laughs> the weather, yeah. <laughs> As a theological topic rather than just a comment at the beginning of the service. <laughs> Okay, um, I'm going to... Uh, <laughs> so I'm going to stop you there, sorry. <laughs> Just because we've got lots to get through. Yeah, yeah, you're awake. That's the main thing. Okay, so um, I suspect the answer was maybe not that often. I don't know. Um, so, Philip, can I have another, another yeah. slide? So just, no, other way. <laughs> yeah, so I want to just give you a bit of background about the, the crisis we are facing at the moment. Um, we have been, until recently, uh, living in what uh, geologists call the Holocene period, the last 10,000 years, when the climate has been, and everything else, the Earth's systems have been quite stable and good for life. Within the last... Few, few decades, really, a new term has arisen, the Anthropocene, which is that, that the definition of that is that our geology is being affected by human activity. And this paper was written by Rockstrom in 2009, and it's widely quoted as a sort of uh, benchmark for what's going on. What he and his colleagues did was they tried to set, they tried to identify boundaries, safe operating spaces for humanity. So basically, they were saying, can we keep going uh, within the, these different spheres of Earth systems? So at the top, we've got climate change, ocean acidification, ozone depletion, nitrogen and phosphate cycles, um, water, land use, biodiversity, uh, aerosols, and pollution. And you can see the green circle in the middle. Is that's, that's what would be safe. That's, that's what would be safe. You can see there's some red bits. Now, the red bits are where we have already exceeded what is the safe operating uh, um, space, as it were, for these different, different issues, particularly nitrogen, climate change, and bio biodiversity loss. That's the biggest of all. So we have way exceeded what would keep us in that sort of stable system, that stable situation which the Holocene was. We are now in, as I said, the Anthropocene, where all of these different um, uh, types of um, sorry, planetary, planetary boundaries, are be, some of them are already being exceeded and some of them may well be exceeded. And there are some unexpected tipping points which can arise. For example, monsoons, um, permafrost melting. There are some things where things don't operate in, in a sort of gradual fashion. So there are things that... Um, boundaries which get crossed and things can change very fast. Climate change is another. Let's fill it the next one. Oh, no, the other way. No, back one. <laughs> that one. So, in 2009, Sir John Beddington was the government's chief scientific advisor, and he described what he called a perfect storm. That due to climate change, we've talked about that already, 
and population growth, demand for energy and water and food is going up very fast. So within that situation that we described just now of planetary boundaries being exceeded, we've got de increasing demand up 50% on energy use, up 30% on water use, up 50% on food. So these are big percentages. And by 2030 is well within my life, most of our lifetimes, I think. Um, so these are not far away in the distant future, but these are, these are things which are happening now. Population, sorry, going back. Population is, when I was born, it was 3.6 billion. Uh, it's now 7.3 billion. By 2100, it's due to be 11 billion. That, that's the trajectory we're on. Um, climate change, at the moment, we're not meeting our Paris obligations, and we're likely to, uh, climate is, going, is likely to, temperatures are likely to increase by up to four degrees centigrade by the end of this century. That has huge implications. And the implications are, yeah, next picture, please, mostly about extremes. So on the left there, we've got where, where we have been recently, which is a relatively stable climate. On the right, which is the end of this century, you can see the dark blue, that's precipitation. The yellow is drought. So they're just more extremes, more extremes of, of rainfall, more extremes of dry, more unpredictability in the system. More energy in the system means more unpredictability. This is the North Pole, the Arctic, as you can see. By the end of the century, it's expected that we won't have any ice there. So that's, you know, that's a huge implication for all sorts of uh, Earth systems. Next one. Uh, going back. So this is sea level, which is one of the things which is obviously impacted by ice melting. Um, again, by the end of the century, this level is 20 centimetres. It doesn't sound very much. My parents live in Bosham, near Chichester on the south coast. I don't know if anybody's been there. Uh, but they have a, a, a gate at the bottom of their garden, like a little uh, tidal gate to keep the water out when it's a particularly high tide. And it's about 20 centimetres high. Um, so 20 centimetres is the lowest estimate of where global um, sea level rise is expected to be by the end of the century. It could be considerably higher. And there are many people around the world who have fewer resources than my parents do to deal with those sorts of things. Um, in Bangladesh, uh, it's estimated that a 10 centimetre rise in sea level would make 2 million people homeless. The IPCC, which is the International Panel on Climate Change, which is the sort of scientific body which looks at all of this information, estimates that by 2050, which again is not that far out, there might be around 150 million climate refugees. So these are people who have had to move because of changes in the climate. Either they have been literally forced out of their home or perhaps there's drought or heavy rains, etc. So the next one, yes. These fra <laughs> people talk about climate change or global warming. Um, it sounds quite nice, although actually, <laughs> actually now this week, <laughs> I think probably people are a bit fed up with global warming, but um, I prefer global weirding as, a, as an expression, I just think, or climate chaos, because that's what it is. It's unpredictability. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen next. These are just different images taken from the last few years of the news. I don't know if you remember, a couple of years ago, we had very extreme um, snowfall on the east coast of America. This is near where I live, on the Somerset levels. We had huge floods in the Somerset levels a couple of years ago. Hurricane Haiyan, I think it was called, in the Philippines, 2014. Wildfires in Europe, which not only destroyed area, but the area they were in, but also killed, they reckon, 30,000 people through premature death due to uh, the effects of high temperatures. So there are many, many impacts of the climate changing. And of course, sorry, one more picture. Um, uh, yeah, uh, that one. Um, the people who suffer first and worst are our poorest global neighbors. I was talking to a guy called Matthew Frost, who was the director of Tear Fund until recently, a couple of years ago. And he said that when he arrived at Tear Fund, which is a Christian development charity, um, he did, they did a study to look at what were the causes of all the things they were dealing with, whether it was refugees or trafficking or poverty or food security. And they did this analysis of what was causing all these different things. And climate change was in there every single time. It's, it's, a kind of, it's like that finger in the dike thing. You know, what's causing all the things that we're dealing with downstream? Climate change, climate change, climate change. It's not the only cause, but it is often the biggest and most common one. Yeah, next one. Population, we've mentioned it before. That's 
I was born around in there somewhere, <laughs> and we're heading for eight or nine billion, uh, sorry, 11 billion by the end of this century. Um, the demographics, there, there are many reasons why population, the world population will eventually stabilize, but in the meantime, we have to cope with a, glo a growing global population. And especially those of us in the West who have a big environmental impact, uh, we'll be all of those people obviously are consuming more resources and having a bigger impact on the planet. Uh, yeah. Plastics. I'm sure many of you watch the David Attenborough program, programs, and I think it's great that we are more aware of what is going on with plastic in the world. Um, they reckon that by 2050, plastic waste will weigh more than all the fish in the sea. The, the plastic in the sea will be heavier than the fish in the sea. We have a huge problem with plastics, and although we're all doing our little bit with our straws and cups and stuff like that, there's a lot, a lot further to go. And then pollution. This is a picture that came from the news last week, I think. This is a little girl in London called Ella, who died of asthma in 2013. And for the first time, a report has been issued and the government accepted that her death was basically due to illegal levels of pollution. She lived near the South Circular Road in South London. And uh, her asthma was exacerbated by the pollution in the atmosphere. So we're, we're causing, we humans <laughs> are causing problems in every different sphere. And finally, in terms of the impacts, creation is groaning. So creation in the wider sense, our animal neighbors are suffering. Uh, this is an image from the World Wildlife Fund's annual report last year. They have calculated that in that period, 1970 to 2012, which is, again, it's incredibly, I was born in 1965, so well within my lifetime, um, we have lost 38% of all mammals, not species, this is every single creature, 81% of amphibians, 36% of fish, and on it goes. So it's the, the rate at which this is happening is really alarming. Um, yep. This is a lovely book. I wanted to bring this with you, with me today, but it's a huge book. Um, I saw it just recently at a conference I was attending called Lost Words. Um, I don't know if anybody was aware that in 2007, I think, the Oxford English Dictionary produced, they produced a new junior dictionary. And there was a huge outcry because they had taken out lots of words like bluebell and buttercup and conquer, and cowslip, and all sorts of lovely words to do with the countryside, kingfisher. And they'd replace them with sort of megabytes, and I don't know, <laughs> I, don't, I can't think of the <laughs> um, computer-based mostly, technology-based words. And a lot of authors and illustrators were very aggravated by this and very sad about this. And so this book has been produced, and I do recommend it if you get a chance to look at it. It's a really beautiful book. Charlie, Charlie was saying she's got a copy. <laughs> Maybe you could bring it into the office next week. <laughs> And these, these, this is a poet or writer and an illustrator, and they've written um, poems uh, to, about these lost words. And, and the, the, the importance of this is th this idea that if we don't know something we won't, and we don't love something, we can't protect it. And if our children don't know and love about creatures and the, and the little sp and the birds and flowers and everything else, they're very unlikely to look after them. So it's just a bit of a signal of the times, I think. So, so that's a real sort of snapshot of where we're at environmentally. Yep, go for it, yeah. So I wanted to look now at uh, what the Bible says. Now, I don't know if anybody's seen this, but this is my green Bible, which I was given a few years ago by my son from Christmas. And it's a bit like those red letter Bibles where Jesus' words are in red, yeah? Well, this is where anything to do with the environment is in green. Now, you could argue about exactly which bits are in green, and I would <laughs> probably argue myself, but there's a lot in here. There are 2,250 or thereabouts green passages in, the, in this Bible, and they're to do with the water, the land, the air, the soil, jubilee, anything to do with the physical world in which we live, Re relationships restored, all sorts of stuff. It's a great, it's quite interesting to see what comes up. So this is, you know, this is the Bible that uh, I think is worth having a look at. Um, you could argue, of course, that it, the Bible was written uh, at a time when agricultural metaphors would have been appropriate, um, and, and, and it would have been written differently if it was written in our days. But I think it does tell us something about God's priorities, because as Christians, what sets our agenda should be what God cares about. 
And I think that we have probably, many of us, including our church leaders, have actually been reading our Bibles, as it were, with blinkers on, with dark glasses on, and we've kind of missed out the bits which refer to, to the, world, the, the physical world. We've, we live in our own little bubbles, don't we? we? We drive in our car to work. We buy our food in plastic wrappings from supermarkets. We've kind of detached ourselves from the physical world. And I think, actually, God is saying we, we need to re-engage. So I want to just run through a few um, principles that come from the Bible. These are taken uh, broadly from uh, a book called Planet Wise by Dave Bookless, who is a colleague of mine who works for Arosha, and he's written one of your... And we have English people this. Yeah. Okay. So this is this is copied, <laughs> loosely copied from Dave, but it's a great sort of sweep through the Bible. So it starts with we start with relationships. We 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 have got three a three cornered relationship: God, people, and the planet. That's how we are designed to be. But we have become increasingly detached from the planet. So next click. Um, the first principle is that. God has made a good world. We can think, think back to Genesis. After every day, God said it was good, it was good, it was good, and finally, it was very good. These are some photographs of moths in Rwanda, where I used to live. We did some moth trapping. Don't worry, they all flew away the next day. They were not harmed. But they're just incredibly beautiful. There they are, flying around in the night. Nobody really can see them. I mean, it's very unlikely that any humans would ever really be able to look at them carefully um, until we trap them. Um, it's an incred incredible, diverse world that we live in. So we live in a good world. God made a good and beautiful world. And at the end of each day, yeah, sorry, God said, can you click on? Uh, keep going. <laughs> That's right. So he created the earth, the creatures and mankind, and he said they were, they were good, they were good, and then finally they were very good. Secondly, in the Bible, we're told that the earth belongs to God, not to us. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, Psalm 24. And it's not limited to the Old Testament. There's a lot in the New Testament about our relationship with, with the earth. Colossians chapter 1 uh, talks about Jesus as the source of creation. By him all things were created. The sustainer of creation. In him all things hold together. And the saviour of creation says there, God is pleased to reconcile himself to all things, whether in earth or in heaven, by making peace through Jesus. So, sorry, next one, yep. Um, so we're, humanity is made both from the dust of the earth, but we're also part of creation. We're sort of apart from it, but we're in it. But Christians have in the past been accused, and are still accused, of not being good um, examples of how to look after the world. Uh, in 1967, Stanford history professor Lynn White accused Christianity of being the most anthropocentric religion in the world. Uh, he wrote a paper called The Historical Roots of the e Ecological Crisis, and he just had it in for Christians. And basically, he blamed it on this verse in the Bible. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds and over every living creature. And the argument was that we, unlike our pagan forebears, Christians, had no reverence for created things, and we were therefore willing to destroy them for our own ends. But I think, actually, that was a little unfair. <laughs> because I think if you look at the text, it's really talking about, it's talking about dominion, but not domination. And there's a difference. So dominion is loving dominion. The beginning, the previous verse, tells us, God says, let us make humans in our image. And if you think about God's image, God's Im image is Jesus. And how, how did Jesus rule? He ruled as a servant, a servant king. Yeah. I, just like, well, I agree with you absolutely. Yeah. But I think Lynn White's point is that people, this verse has been abused, and that Christians historically have used it uh, in that way. Fair enough. You know, uh, you're absolutely right. Christians have used it, and, and, and they still continue to use yeah. it, I would say. But uh, I'm trying to set the record straight. <laughs> it doesn't have to be like that. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, no, it's absolutely true. And of course, in Genesis 2, the second creation account, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden to work it and take care of it, to till it and keep it, to serve it and preserve it. So there are lots of other ways of looking at it. So yeah, next one, it says, yeah, we're called to be stewards of the environment and not to exploit it. So going on, creation is good, but it's been spoiled. And if you keep going, yeah, to the next one. 
um, those relationships have been broken. And there are loads of passages in the Bible which talk about how the human sin has caused those broken relationships. Um, Hosea says, there is no faithfulness, no love, no acknowledgement of God in the land. There is only cursing and lying and murder, stealing and adultery. Because of this, the land dries up and all who live in it waste away. The birds of the field and the birds in the sky. The beasts of the field and the birds in the sky. So there are lots of passages in the Old Testament, particularly where they talk about human sin causing destruction of the earth. And uh, recently, Pope Francis, I don't know if anybody heard or saw his encyclical on the environment called Laudato Si, uh, where he, he, he wrote this long letter to the world, basically. It was very widely applauded by environmentalists, by politicians, by church leaders uh, in 2015. And he wrote, the violence in our hearts, wounded by sin, is also reflected in the symptoms of sickness evident in the soil, in the water, the air, and all forms of life. So the root of the environmental crisis is us. And so to fix the planet, we actually need to fix ourselves and our relationship with God, that, that broke, those, all of those broken relationships. So the next slide, please, yeah. So the next theme going through the Bible is covenant. Now, obviously, there are many covenants through the Bible. One of them, this one will may, may give you a clue. Any ideas? <laughs> Noah, OK, so Noah. Um, now, in my green Bible, can you go to the next slide? This is what it says. Don't worry, you don't have to read all this. But this is the section from Genesis 9, where it talks about God's covenant with Noah. Now, if you go to the next one, please. I would suggest that they've got the heading wrong. <laughs> because if you read those green bits highlighted, who is God making a covenant with? Any ideas? Any? Just shout them out. All of life. All of life. Yeah, and yeah, the earth, which is whether that's animate or inanimate. But <laughs> yeah, I'm making a covenant between me and the earth, me and you and every living creature, me and all of life. It goes on, you know, repeat, repeats that over and over again, and I think that's a really important um, message that we often. I certainly, until a few years ago, I had never noticed that, and I certainly nothing, 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 not something I'd had preached on in church. Um, keep going, please. <laughs> so we're moving on to incarnation. So this is Jesus. Now, keep going. Um, when, let's stop there. Um, we, we all know the most famous verse in the Bible, John 3:16. Uh, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Now, when I lived in Rwanda, the Bible in Kinya Rwanda, which is the local language, um, used, it, it, instead of saying, for God so loved the world, it actually said, for God so loved the people of the world. That's what they'd actually translated it as. And I think that reflects a common misunderstanding because actually the word in the Bible is cosmos. And cosmos, sorry, in the Greek, sorry, cosmos, which means the world, not just the people. <laughs> Clearly, the people are included but it's, uh, it's, not just, it's not just us that God loves. Um, so that's that bit. Um, and f one more, yeah, sorry, yes, there's a nice moving image. <laughs> there we are. So God loves us and ev everything in the world. New creation. Now, this is another controversial subject which your American friends will probably <laughs> leap onto. Eschatology. Um, again, I'm not going to go into it. I'm not a theologian. Um, but there is a strand of, of, of Christian thinking, particularly popular in the America and coming this way, I feel. Uh, things like the Left Behind series, I don't know if you're familiar with that, those stories, where in order to speed up Jesus' return, we are encouraged to burn as much fossil fuel as possible to cause destruction of the world so that Jesus can come back quickly. I mean, that's in a nutshell is what they're saying. Um, I think there's plenty of evidence in the Bible that actually it's not quite like that. <laughs> Um, so, for example, in Revelation, the, the passage which talks about a new heaven and a new earth, the word is kainos, not neos, and kainos, I'm told by scholars, means renewed. It's a bit like when a snake, there's a, that passage in uh, 1 Corinthians, um, sorry, 2 Corinthians, when we become Christians, we become new creations in Christ. Now, clearly, we are the same, we have the same bodies, but we are renewed inside, and perhaps that's something about what happens to the earth at the end of time. Um, and similarly, those references to fire and judgment um, and destruction 
the, 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 there are similar passages which talk about uh, a refiner's fire, so that means it is cleansed and purified, not just trashed. Um, don't ask me too many questions about this because <laughs> I, I am not the theologian in the room. Um, but we have plenty of good theologians who are. Bishop Tom Wright, who many of you will know um, or have read his stuff, is uh, very keen on this element of eschatology and theology. And he has written this, that Christian hope is not simply of going to heaven when we die, but for new heavens and a new earth integrated together. That new earth will emerge from the old, and it's therefore incumbent upon us to care for it. Um, Bishop James Jones, who was until a while ago the Bishop of Liverpool, he said, Jesus will come to renew all things. And in the meantime, Christians are called to participate in the earthing of heaven by doing God's will on earth. And one final strand, if we can keep going, witness. So, one more picture. In 2005 or thereabouts, I took part in a climate march, one of the early climate marches. There we were walking down Piccadilly in London with our banners, and I was with my friend Cordelia, and we'd come from our town in Somerset in a bus, and um, she looked around and she saw all these banners. One was Operation Noah, one was Christian Aid, one was CAFOD, one was Tear Fund, and she said, why are all these Christians out here? And um, I said, well, that's because we care about this stuff, you know. <laughs> and, um, and she was really amazed, and I think many people are, um, because she didn't, she said, I've never seen, I've never heard Christians talking about these things. And she was a keen, she is a keen green environmentalist. Um, and she said, you know, if only I knew that Christians under, you know, if, if I believed that God made the world, then it would be obvious to look after it. I don't happen to believe that, but <laughs> I don't see Christians doing that very much, as you rightly pointed out. So, and uh, keep clicking, yep. Uh, Rob Frost, who, who died some years ago now, but he said this, when Christians take the earth seriously, then people will take the gospel seriously. And I, I, I really like that quote. I think it's very helpful. So, how are we doing for time? Philip, tell me uh, when I've got to stop. We've got another 15 minutes for you to do For talk, question. fine, okay. So, uh, Just checking. <laughs> I'm on track. Good. So I now want to think about how we can do... I've done a bit of that about what's happening in the world. We've talked about what the Bible says. I want to think about what, how we can engage. So next slide, please. Um, what can we do about it? What is our contribution, our unique contribution, perhaps, as Christians, both as a personal level, uh, a church level, in our communities in our wider society, business, wherever we're involved. How can we as Christians get involved? Well, I just want to throw out a few examples and then maybe we can have a conversation about that. Um, on a personal basis, we just need to think about our impact on the world, don't we? We need to think about our, our impact on the planet. This is a copy of our... I work for Climate Stewards. We do carbon offsetting. This is our carbon calculator. So we, we look at people's carbon footprint and how to reduce it. So if you happen to have flown in from New York, I could tell you that, that would have be, you would be responsible for 1.6 tonnes of CO2 from that return flight. And then there was a way to, as it were, offset that. But I'm not talking about that now. But the point is, we need to think about how we can shrink our footprint. The Church of England has a national campaign called Shrinking the Footprint. And it's not, of course, just our carbon footprint. We, think we have many choices we make every day, don't we? Um, choices relating to water, plastics, waste, family planning, food, conservation, careers, ethics, investments. You know, in every area of our lives, we, are, we have a footprint, we have an impact. And I guess if we want to be speaking and prophetically speaking about these issues, then we need to look at ourselves first. We need to examine our own lifestyles and see what we can do to reduce our impact. So secondly, as churches, um, if you are involved in a local church in the UK anyway, there's a great project called Eco Church, which is just a, basically a toolkit for churches to audit their lives and look at ways they can uh, in, in, decrease their impact on the planet and increase their, their care for the world around them. Speak Up is about talking to your local MP about the things that you care about environmentally. Hope for the Future is training churches to go and talk to their MPs. The Big Clean Switch is encouraging churches or enabling churches to switch church life. Um, and, and someone, helpfully, this is some uh, colleague, a uh, friend of mine at OMF, who was talking about this and he produced this slide, which I think is a much more helpful image of how the church 
can be involved in all these different areas. And they do overlap. We talked about witness in terms of creation care. If we are out caring for the world, then people notice that, and that contributes to our witness. So these all overlap. And of course, Christians have a huge opportunity to be countercultural. We heard earlier about being sacrificial in the way we lived. Um, uh, Jubilee, you know all about Keep Sunday Special, about um, earlier campaigns, William Wilberforce, civil rights, all those kinds of things. We, we as Christians have an opportunity to stand up and, and stand up for things which are not often popular. Wilberforce, he asked us to do the impossible, and he said there is a place between denial and despair called hope, and that's <coughs> what we should inhabit. So that was the Anglican Church. The Catholics, as I mentioned earlier, have this amazing document called Laudato Si, and if you have a spare hour or three, I really recommend it. It's quite a weighty document, but it's fantastic. Um, and the Pope wrote to his flock around the world, he said, we all need an ecological conversion. Um, he said, where by the effects of our, uh, our encounter with Jesus Christ, we to are to become, more, sorry, when the effects of our encounter with Jesus Christ are to become more evident in our relationship with the world around us. Creation care, he said, is not an option or a secondary issue. It should be central to our Christian faith. And then politics. Um, I think Philip mentioned that a couple of years ago, oh golly, nearly three years ago now, I cycled, I set off in the rain, heavy rain, <laughs> from Wells Cathedral in Somerset, and I cycled and I, well, I accumulated a few more friends along the way. But by the end, anyway, I joined with a group of pilgrims to Paris. And in the end, there were, well, we took a, a petition for one point, with 1.8 million signatures on it to Christina Figueres, who was chairing the Paris Climate Talks in 2015. Um, and it was a very powerful moment. It's a very interesting moment for me uh, to participate in. But getting involved in politics is something that we can do at different, and we, um, we've heard about that just, just earlier, but in particularly on this, on this issue. Um, the Bishop of Oxford, I don't know if you've heard recently at the General Synod last week, he um, called on the church to divest from fossil fuels, stop investing its money in fossil fuels. And he said, and I think this is, these are really interesting points he made, these are the reasons, he said to, to the to, um, climate change people, that you should invest, you should work with faith communities. First, faith communities make up the majority of the global population. We have a population of seven billion people. Of those, about six have a faith would you know, profess to some faith or other. If we ignore them, well, we ignore them at our peril. So first of all, faith communities have a big influence, a potential influence. Secondly, faith shapes our values. We, we learn to live against our personal self-interest sometimes. We pray, give us today our daily bread, which actually means give us exactly what we need and no more. Help us to be content with our daily bread. So we understand about sacrifice, and that might mean cutting our carbon footprint, not going on that flight or whatever. Um, and third, the faith communities are global communities. So we have Christian brothers and sisters all around the world, and we're very aware, often, through the links of our churches, of how we, are, how we interact. So we are, Christians particularly understand that, I think, and not just Christians, all faith groups, understand and know people in other communities. Um, and also, finally, faith communities know how to take action for change. Christians are disciples. We know the world is imperfect, and we know how to mobilize people. Uh, Margaret Mead said this, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, that's the, the only thing they ever did. Um, when we got to Paris, if you go to the next slide, we met with, we had a, a, an event in Paris. I don't know if you remember that Paris, it was a strange time because we just had the bombings in Paris like the week before. In fact, this, this was a tier fund sponsored bicycle ride and it was canceled, but we all said, we're going to go anyway, so we went without the tier fund backup. But um, we had to meet, instead of marching up to a not, um, what's it called, the uh, Eiffel Tower, we had to meet in a hall. However, we handed over our petition of nearly two million signatures to, to this group of faith leaders from all around the world. Um, they then gave it to Christina Figueres. When she came onto the stage, she, she burst into tears. This is a woman who was chairing the Paris climate talks the next morning. 
um, because she said, I feel the weight of your expectations on my shoulders. It's up to me now. You've done all the hard work. You have walked and fasted and bicycled and everything else. I now have to deliver it. And she did. I mean, the Paris Agreement was remarkable. Nobody expected that pledge to get to 1.5, a, a target of 1.5 degrees above the baseline. We are not there. It's not being implemented at the moment. But the agreement itself was remarkable. Um, keep going. I think I mentioned the General Synod, so this is another area where faith groups have been intervening and engaging with politics. So the Anglican Church has, wait for, anybody know how much money the Anglican Church has to invest? It's pretty remarkable. <laughs> Guess? Billions. Keep going. It's not millions, it's... It's 7.9 billion pounds, has the Anglican Church. Uh, and so it's a major player in what they call the Transition Pathway Initiative Coalition, which is a group of investors who are trying to move investments into cleaner, cleaner investment, as it were, and to try and align those businesses with the Paris Agreement targets. So last week, Justin Welby, the Archbishop, was at the Stock Exchange addressing this group, and he said, climate change is the greatest existential threat of our time. The political philosopher Edmund Burke at the end of the 18th century said this. He said, the, the social contract is a covenant between those who've lived in the past, those who are alive today, and extraordinarily, for those years, he went on to say, for those who are yet unborn. And in a way, that's exactly what we talk about loving our neighbor. We love our, our current neighbor. We love our global neighbor. And we also love our future neighbor. That's why we care about climate change. Uh, yes, and there are organizations out there lobbying. So this is Operation NOAA. They had a huge campaign to try and get weight behind that divestment commitment, which was, it, it was altered during the Synod, but essentially the church pledged to divest from oil and, or to, to, to only invest in company, um, energy companies which are moving away from oil and gas towards other forms of energy by 2023, which is remarkable. Um, other things that have happened, the church has led the way on. This bishop, <laughs> um, Bishop of Dudley, um, used a bamboo toothbrush for Lent. Well, big deal. But um, he was making a point. He was, there were various initiatives around plastics over Lent. People talked about a plastic-free Lent, and actually it caught quite a lot of the public imagination. So the church has a position, has an, all, an opportunity to engage and to lead the way. Um, locally, uh, I come from a town in Somerset, and... A few years ago, when the new batch of MPs were, um, had just been, induct, uh, just been voted in, there was an event in London where they encouraged people to come and meet their new MP and talk to them about climate change. So that's our new MP, uh, who is a Tory, and there's me and some others. And as a result of that, a whole, not just me meeting him, but as a result of that initiative, a whole bunch of things have happened, which essentially the key thing was that the town council came to us, a group of Christians, and said, we want to engage with our local population on the issues around the environment. Can you, the church, help us? And I think that's a really interesting turnaround because it doesn't usually work like that. We were rather surprised, but, <laughs> but <laughs> it's amazing how people do sometimes see the church as more influential than perhaps we do. Um, finally, I just put, this is, we're nearly up for time, aren't we? These are some of the questions that I thought were quite interesting to think about, which came out of what I've just talked about. Um, you may have other questions, but these are some I thought of. Um, so how do we make creation care, which is a sort of <coughs> shorthand for what I've been talking about, as mainstream as social justice is now for Christians? Redivestment, that's divesting from fossil fuels, is it better to influence from inside the tent, which is what the church policy has been until now, or is it better to shake the dust off our feet and say, no, we're not going to do that? And that, there, there are parallels, obviously, with other things. Uh, and how far should Christian environmental groups go with working with people of different theological positions or other faiths and none? Because that happens a lot. There are a lot of multi-faith or interfaith uh, opportunities. And then do we need special Christian environmental groups or can't we all just go and join Greenpeace? Any thoughts?